and Gui, who are sitting right next to me. It's just a lovely rainy afternoon here uh, in Takasamaya and Kinukunia. Welcome, Dan. Hello. Hi. Thank Sorry, I'm a little late. It's okay. I'm hardly in town on Sunday. Never mind. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. It's so crowded outside and I couldn't find a parking space. Okay, so here we are. Um, this is uh, the um, DVD of the two movies that Glenn has directed, Forever Fever, and if I turn this around, The Blue Mansion. And, and we'd like to take this opportunity actually to ask Glenn a little bit more about the two movies and what you can expect inside this DVD. So, it's wonderful that I'm a friend and also a colleague. You can help me when I <laughs> uh, Yes, I made my first film for a fever um, 13 years ago in 1998. Um, and, and then, you know, it took me another 10 years to make my second film. Um, and a lot of people have asked me um, why I took such a long time. But I feel that um, for myself, personally, I will only make a film, because film, film making is very, very difficult, and I will only make a film if I feel that there is something important that I need to say um, as an artist. So um, that's why it's been such a long time. Um, both of them are very, very different. So it's a romantic comedy, and um, Blue Mansion is um, a very dark comedy. Um, so people might think it's very strange that I include both films as a DVD box set. But in actual fact, both films are my own personal record of what um, I feel Singapore is. Um, Bro Fever, set in 1978, um, was my own personal record of growing up in Singapore in the 70s um, when life was much simpler, Singapore was just a developing country but where I felt that people had uh, a, more, a better sense of, of their own identity and who, who they are and um, why they belong to here. Um, life was much simpler, since we had less, but I think we seem to be happier. Uh, the Blue Mansion, although it's not a romantic comedy, included in this DVD box set because really it is my own record of what I still think for it today, um, 30 years later, you know, in 2010. Um, so really, uh, although both films are uh, different, different genres, um, they're both really my own personal record, my own view of uh, Singapore. One going up in the 70s and another one um, in for today. Thank you, that's brilliant. Let's begin with Forever Fever. Tell us a story about what it is about. And also, how did it begin? This was your first movie, and before that, um, you were in England, you were doing 100% theatre. Let's begin with what made you make that leap into film, and why this story? Um, I made the leap because I was directing theatre in London in the early 90s, and we were performing in small, very small theatres, um, a lot of pubs and bars, you know, um, sometimes 30 seaters. And after five years of uh, directing and producing in London, I felt that I needed a much wider audience. I wanted to tell my story to a bigger audience, and I felt that the only medium which would allow me that would be um, film, would be the film screen. Now, the story of Forever Fever, obviously, um, is something very close to my heart. Uh, because I grew up in Singapore in the 70s, and I wanted and, and the movie Seven Seven Night Fever and this film music had a very big impression on me. Yeah, they had a big impression on me. As it did on the whole world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. indeed, yeah. So I, I wanted to um, document that period in my life. It, it, it was a very, very fun and um, rich, uh, colorful uh, period. But also, um, I chose 1978 um, as a point um, for Corelli and Fever. More importantly, because we also got our first McDonald's in 1978, and I, I, I felt I used McDonald's as a, you know, a signpost uh, or, or a, a gauge because after we, we got McDonald's, we got everything else from America, America what I call American cultural imperialism. Before 1978, you know, um, Singapore was very Asian, much more Asian, you know, and um, so I, I used that as a signpost 1978. And of course, in Brown Fever, I explore the issues of identity, which we are still uh, exploring in Singapore today. 
who we are, what a thing for me to me. Um, to please think, you know, we've just had an election. Um, these are all important and pertinent questions which we keep on asking ourselves. Who are we as Singaporeans? What does we Singaporean mean? What is our identity? In Braille Fever, I explore that, um, that uh, cultural um, sort of like confusion uh, that I had growing up as a teenager, you know, um, because before 1978, I grew up on Bruce Lee films, and Bruce Lee was the big role model in my life. And then we had, uh, you know, American films, we had George Volta and Saturday Night Fever, and I used that as um, a symbol of, you know, m my confusion about whether I'm East or West, um, or whether I can I find a balance between getting the best of both cultures. Um, for those of you who may not know, Forever Fever, uh, Forever Fever featured a much younger Asian punk, <laughs> a much younger Asian punk, although really he, he looks, you know, he looks just the same today, playing um, a John Travolta-esque uh, role, a young Singaporean man who is disco crazy and um, decides to uh, join a competition. Uh, it is a highly, highly entertaining, very heartwarming and touching uh, drama. It's also extremely funny. Um, now, bring us behind the scenes. Now, I know a lot about the behind the scenes, but bring us behind the scenes. How did you write this story? How did you piece the story together? Now, I know that it was um, done on a budget where a lot of homework and a lot of work had to be done by yourself. You not only produced it, you wrote it, the story came from you, I was there, you casted the thing on your own, you, 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 you did everything on your own. And tell us a little bit about that process. No, no, you helped me in the casting. <laughs> you helped me in the casting. And, I wasn't uh, pitching, I wasn't pitching. <laughs> like, no, 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 you did very much with my casting director. And in fact, yeah. you know, a little tip that nobody knows is that when we were casting for the film, we discovered this young actor. Oh, no, he wasn't an actor, in fact, he was in Chatek. And then, you know, he picked yes, one of the said, oh my god, you must see this actor, he's really hot. He's very cute, and his very name, cute. His name was Pierre Pearl. Yes. And, and that's where we discovered Pierre Pearl, he was just a shot at student. And Pierre Pearl is in Forever Fever, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and King Wan, King Wan discovered Pierre Pearl, really, actually, it wasn't me. But I put him in, a, in, in my film, and, and the year after Forever Fever, you know, he, he, he joined me to call. So, and, and that, that's his year after that. So, so you actually launched the career of Yes, and I want with to mark that right with here and now in Kinokunia. With your help. Yes, you found it. Yeah, he like walked out and my luck <laughs> <laughs> brought him into the limelight and you know he hasn't looked back yeah, since. Yes. Fourteen years old. He my must God. have been twenty four. Yeah. yeah. In yeah. fact, there are lots of familiar faces um, in Forever Fever yeah. and many of them are still in entertainment today, Annabelle Francis. Yeah, well, yeah, um, I've been Madeline, and whom I've been wondering what's happened to her, the lead actress Madeline Khan. Well, you know, well, what's happened to her? And I, I just discovered that I've been listening to, to her on the radio on 91.3. She has a radio um, program with Cheryl Mao, so I think between 4 and 7 or, you know, yeah. time home. Yeah, and that's her. So she's come back to Singapore and she's really teaching again. Now, when the film was completed, it really enjoyed um, a type of success that, that you never imagined. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was um, just just amazing because, um, you know, I, I had never produced a film in my life, I had never written a film in my life, or directed a film in my life, um, and um, I, I didn't know where this, this film was going. I didn't know anything about sales distribution or marketing, but um, I, I was very fortunate that uh, an Australian film distributor watched the film in the studio in Sydney, without my permission, without my knowing, and then he called me and said, you know, he was on his way to Cannes, could he bring a print with him? So I said, yeah, sure, he brought a print with him, and on the first week that he arrived, he had a private screening for Harvey Weinstein. Uh, Harvey Weinstein is um, the producer of many Australian films like Shakespeare in Love, and in fact, the one which one is here, that picture? This one is here? Yeah. This year, uh, uh, does anybody know? I don't know who won the best. Pink, uh, it was a tiny uh, pink speech. Pink speech, uh, yeah. Pink speech. Harvey Weinstein was also. No, what do you think? 
Oh, yes, it was. It was Kate. Yes, yeah. Harvey Weinstein is also the producer of King's Speech, Shakespeare and Love, The English Station, et cetera, et cetera. So he saw the film at a very private screen just for himself. And um, Harvey Weinstein loves musicals. He's a New Yorker. And he loves this show because he grew up in that period as well. So um, he was very excited. And he bought the film there and then. And, and then after that, I would sign on with Mir Max for five years. Um, yeah. And that's the story. That, that is amazing, and until today, um, I believe that and Forever Fever is still the first Singaporean movie to be signed on by a large, uh, you know, U.S.-based uh, production, film production and company. And it was also shown commercially. It's very, very hard to get a commercial release in America because, you know, you have to fight with so, so many other films. But it was shown commercially in America in uh, 2000, in Boston, in San Francisco, Chicago, um, New York. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm thrilled about that, and also, also showing the Sundance Festival. So, um, you know, what the audience right here today can enjoy is a little bit of personal tidbits because Glenn is, Glenn is one of my closest friends, and uh, I'm not ashamed <laughs> to ask him personal questions to share with you. One of them is, when was the last time you saw Forever Fever? And and when you watch it now, I mean, the film was made 14 years ago. When you watch it now, what are the feelings that it brings up in you, Glenn? Well, I, I, ha I haven't seen, the, I mean, up to the last, I mean, after I made the film in 1998, I never watched the film again. I've never watched the film again for 12 years. Why? Um, partly because, um, as a perfectionist, I, 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 I can't stand seeing my own work because I can see all the flaws. There are a lot of flaws, you know, I can see, oh no, I can see that, I can see all the problems, so I, I hate watching my own films or my own work. Um, the, the beauty of theatre is that I can watch it every day, and I can see any faults, I can correct the faults, you see. I can tell that the actor can do things differently, or I can tell the lighting on the set. That's the beauty of theatre. I can watch a play every day. So yes, you do. <laughs> film, I don't. After it's, it's done, it's shown um, to, uh, to the public, I never watch the film again. Um, I watched the film last year again after um, a lot of persuasion from my very close friends um, um, who had not watched it for many years and, and they said I should watch it again. So I watched it last year after an absence of 12 years and I realized um, how much of myself I had put into the film. Now, by that I mean, um, a lot of people have asked me, so which character do you identify with in the film? And 13 years ago, I couldn't answer that question. Uh, um, because I, obviously, I said probably the lead actor, you know, with play by Adrian Park, because he loves disco dancing, that's what he was in, in the 70s. Um, you know, it, 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 but now I realize that actually, watching the film, um, I'm all three characters. There's the two brothers, and there's a two, in the film, there are two brothers and a sister. Just like in the Blue Mansion, there are two brothers and a sister. Um, so, I realized after 13 years um, how much I had put into the film, which, which is about myself. Um, you know, it, it, it's a, a, a personal uh, journey. Um, in the